everyone to another episode of Compressed FM, a podcast all about web development and design with a little bit of zest. In this episode, we're going to talk about software design patterns for human relationships. Web development and design, who would have guessed what we can do on both, even add a little zest. So turn up the volume, get ready for the best. Let's get it started in this episode of Compressed. What's up, everyone? My name is James Quick, and I am a full-time technical content creator. Hello, my name is Amy Dutton, and I am the Director of Design at Zeal. And we are happy to be sponsored by Storyblock, which is a really amazing headless CMS option for people that are looking for a great way to create and manage their data and then use APIs to bring that into their uh, code. So this is uh, one that I've been using recently. I've got a few YouTube videos on Storyblock. It's been really amazing. One of the things that really stands out to me is their live preview. So you can connect your application running locally basically to the Storyblock dashboard. And you can see live previews of your data inside of there, exactly what it's going to look like on your site. Not only that, from the site that you're viewing, you can like edit and move data and view it and all these really cool things once you set up these connections between your locally running site data with the stuff that shows in Storyblock. So if you're interested in a headless CMS for your site, uh, make sure to check out Storyblock. And thank you to Storyblock for sponsoring. And uh, now we can welcome on our amazing guest and Eric Anderson. Welcome to the show. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell people a little bit about your background? Yes. Uh, my name is Eric Anderson. I am a senior software engineer and developer advocate at Yum Brands. I am also a co-organizer of the Dallas Software Developers Meetup Group. And in my free time, I'm a mentor and coach for junior developers trying to get their first job in tech. So excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Cool. Uh, do you want to just out of my, like, what kind of stuff do you do for junior developers? Like, what does that mentorship uh, look like? Yeah. So resume review, interview prep, uh, LinkedIn review, uh, portfolio guidance, uh, job search strategy, opportunity identification. A lot of that is online. LinkedIn is my primary platform. Uh, but then I also have a, some newsletter, blog articles, and one-on-one -on -one uh, coaching if they want to reach out and connect with me on my links, which I think are hopefully part of the show notes. It cool. will be. Yeah, we'll have that in all uh, for people that are watching us live. I'll go ahead and uh, grab this link and throw it in the chat as well. Um, I don't remember if we had talked about this or not, but doing community stuff in Dallas, uh, my friend Danny Thompson moved to Dallas about a year ago. Are you all collaborating on community stuff there? Yes, that's the same meetup. Cool. Yes. Uh, so it used to be the free code camp Dallas meetup that we've recently rebranded to be broader, mm -hmm. just Dallas software developers. Uh, so currently we meet monthly, but we're looking to go uh, twice a month and do a variety of topics. So we're not focused on any specific technology or language, but just anything that interests us. Cool. Love it. Uh, Danny was a big, like, big factor in growing the community here in Memphis before he moved to Dallas. Um, so I'm sure you will continue to see like more growth and impact for the community there. Yes. And I was talking to Danny and he even said that you were a big impact on his career as well. <laughs> you were a, a mentor or a coach for his uh, coding program back in the day. Is that, am I representing that right? Yeah. So a program called Launch Code. It's a boot camp started in St. Louis. They've gotten funding to replicate that in different cities. And I taught the uh, in-person ver version of that boot camp here in Memphis. And Danny was uh, one of the students in that boot camp. So a lot of the community members now that do a lot of amazing stuff for the community came through that program, either as a student or as a TA. And they we've all kind of stuck together and done a lot since then. So, Well, thanks for raising him up and then sending him my way so that <laughs> yeah. I, I can hang out with him now. Absolutely. I still um, want to meet Danny. You should. You've never gotten to meet Danny? Mm -mm. No. We need to have him on the podcast. Yeah, we yeah, should. Yeah, you should. You should. I'll, I'll reach out to him. He should be, um, he should be at yeah. Render this year as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's there's our chance. Um, Eric, do you want to like, so before we get into like the main topic, do you want to give more of like your background just from an engineering perspective? And I think there's a few different ways we'll eventually tie that into like the human relationships and work life balance and enjoyment of what you're doing and stuff. But sure. you just want to give people a little bit more about your technical experience, like what kind of jobs and roles and stuff you've been in? Yeah, yeah. So I've been a software engineer for about 10 years. Uh, during that time, 
I have built digital solutions for about 14 different companies, ranging from small startups to Fortune 100. Uh, I started off as a mobile developer, then went into management and hated it. Uh, spoiler, that's part of the conversation <laughs> today and where a lot of my, my journey's uh, impetus uh, is from. And then the last three years, I'm in a back-end developer role. Uh, for Yum Brands, which is the largest company that probably nobody's heard about. It's the world's largest restaurant company. Uh, it's the parent to Taco Bell, KFC, Pizza Hut, and the Habit Burger. Uh, what was so the last one? The Habit Burger, a recent acquisition, mostly West Burger? Coast. Yes. Huh. Highly, highly recommend it. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're trying to expand. Okay. But it's probably my favorite burger place now. And I'm not just saying that because I work there. <laughs> I will. I'll fly out to the West Coast and try it and let you know. <laughs> there you go. Sounds good. Sounds good. So, Amy wants to say something. <laughs> I do. I want to know why you didn't like management. Yeah. Oh yes. So I found that my primary motivation for learning how to program is because I like to play with stuff. Right. I like to build things. It's it's mm -hmm. Legos essentially. Right. Digital Legos. Um, management requires a different skill set, right? Whereas before I enjoyed the creative process of solving a difficult problem, uh, you hit management and a lot of it is meetings and yeah. conflict resolution and financial planning and roadmaps. And you got like the corporate politics and relationships you're trying to manage. And all of a sudden, Everything that I enjoyed about software development was gone. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had to make a decision, right? Do I continue to go down a path that I'm not optimistic that I will enjoy and make more money, but at the sacrifice of personal fulfillment? Uh, James, you gave a, key, a wonderful keynote at the That Conference uh, where you yeah, talked you a little bit about burnout and you know, finding your, your meaning in life and that really spoke to me because that and part of the reason why I wanted to be on, on y'all's podcast, because uh, that resonated a lot with my own journey and some of the personal life decisions that I'm trying to make. Well, thank you. I gotten that comment a few times and that's like the beauty for me of doing stuff like that is the, for it, for it to be relatable to people, inspirational for people, all those things. And I think this is like, again, like a lot of similarities to what you not necessarily pitched us, but like what you included in, in our notes for the show today. And uh, these, these titles are great. Retitle this episode to this, but you've got, uh, you've got a self-acclaimed or self-proclaimed title of world's happiest software engineer. Before we get to that point, yes, you yes. said <laughs> before that you were the world's unhappiest software engineer. So tell me a little bit about like, what was the unhappiness for you as a developer? What were some of the things that you were struggling with? Like what was, what was the negative side for you about being an engineer and maybe a little bit of, of detail about like what was going on and like professionally or, or maybe in life, if, if there was other rel relevant details there. Yeah. Great, great question. So back at that time in my life, uh, this was at the very beginning of COVID I worked at a consulting firm and projects were getting canceled. Companies were restricting mm -hmm. their budget. This was uh, salaries are being cut. Layoffs were happening. So there's a lot of pressure on top of the pressure of working in a role that I didn't really enjoy. So I'm, I'm grateful for COVID because it opened up an opportunity for me to kind of revision what my future looked mm -hmm. like because of all of those uh, factors. At the moment, it sucked, yeah. <laughs> right? Yep. Uh, but yep. Grateful in hindsight. <clears throat> uh, but to kind of paint the picture a little bit more and what that looked like for me, uh, I was having panic attacks at work where I couldn't breathe. I had to go to the ER. I was having internal bleeding. Uh, the diagnosis, too much stress. Really? Right? Like yeah. actual internal bleeding? Actual internal bleeding. Wow. E an ER rush. That was, that, was, that was the epiphany for me if something yeah. had to change, right? Mm -hmm. Like you weren't kidding when you were talking about the world's mm -hmm. unhappy <laughs> yeah, developer. Yes, you were like yes. literally dying on the inside. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. And a lot of that was my own self-defeating thoughts and behaviors. I put myself in some situations that were my own doing. Mm -hmm. um, but 
I figured in that moment when something had to change, I figured in order to have any good goal, I needed accountability, uh, you know, exercise, weight loss program, what have you. So how do I have a goal of being happy? How do I, how am I accountable <laughs> to that? What does that look like? So I figured yep. practically, uh, I would give myself the title of just the happiest guy, you know, <laughs> mm. and that's forced me to, at least in my digital interactions on LinkedIn specifically, to be a little bit more conscious of how I'm phrasing things and how I'm interacting with my audience. Uh, and it's bled into my uh, professional uh, world as well. Uh, and I found that the more I put positive energy out there, the more positive energy comes my way. So uh, in short, it's more of a journey than a destination of being mm -hmm. the world's happiest software engineer. And uh, just really grateful for you all and everybody um, has been very supportive of that. Um, it's been a great journey. Yeah. Um, one thing just to call out is appreciation for you just for being open about this story. Like the more we talk about mm -hmm. it, I think the more people are going to relate to it. And again, like I talked about in my keynote, like some of the struggles I've been through hard times in my life, but then like what does the other side look like and how do you respond to that and what do you do with it? And, um, it's, it's amazing to hear that you kind of had that, um, that moment for yourself of realizing just something needs to be different. And like, however people accomplish that, like whatever people use to get to a point where they change something in their lives, like that is, that's the thing. That's what it's all about. Cause we all have struggles. It, I was telling my wife recently, like anything that I've gone through in my life, the, the older I've gotten, the more I realize like there, everyone else has gone through equally as many things. And so many people have gone through worse that like, mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's how we respond to those things. Um, so I actually want to include a question here from, uh, from the chat about they, they kind of phrase this as semi random, but I think it's going to fit in maybe to your story of like during COVID, you know, they like, they let people go, which means there's less people and they're probably trying to have the same amount of output, which in my mind, this is like, that that's just not how the world works. Like you have less people, you're going to be less efficient or you're going to at least do less bulk work, even though employers don't see it that way. And they put this extra pressure and maybe you're working more hours, more nights, whatever. I don't, I don't exactly know. So maybe you can add to that. But the question here was um, how important is it for devs to understand that, that you don't have to know all the things that like it's a learning process. It's a journey. And, and how does that maybe factor in or did it to your situation of feeling like, maybe overwhelmed, maybe just not respected as an employee, not appreciated as an employee. But uh, mm -hmm. was there any of that like balance for you of like, I don't have to know everything and that's okay. And this is a journey of like, I'm going to continue to build knowledge. Yeah, a lot to unpack there. So two thoughts. Uh, the first was at that time, uh, I was actually in a management role. Mm -hmm. And the, the big push was to sell more because we're losing all of this work. And forced me to have a lot of uh, direct conversations with that I felt were very tone deaf. Like our clients mm -hmm. are also suffering that we're trying to mm -hmm. sell work to. I, I was in a consultancy. Yeah. And my first response is to, hey, can you give me more money? Because I'm struggling. I, I really didn't like that yeah. dynamic. Uh, so that led to a lot of that internal tension. And then regarding the idea of having to know everything. Uh, I think I, if I could go back early on in my career, I wish I was more proactive in asking questions and grabbing work that I knew I didn't know how to accomplish. Uh, so as a junior developer, you're given a lot of grace, right? <laughs> we expect you to ask questions. <laughs> Your partner typically with a senior developer Um and I know because of my own fear, and this is one of my own self-defeating behaviors, is f because of my fear of failure, I would stick inside the scope, mm -hmm. the language, uh, the part of the system that I knew, and I would just only grab tickets related to that domain. And then I became mid-level, sen senior level even, and oh, crap. Like, I really <laughs> only know this, and now there's all this expectation. Um so now part of my counter behaviors that I'm trying to implement is being very open about what I don't know mm -hmm. and being very intentional, uh, grabbing the next ticket from the backlog that I don't know what the answer looks like and, and uh, just trying it, right? And being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I think 
That, oh man, that's such a great line there. Being uncomfortable with, or being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, when I think about when I was doing freelance work, I would actually build stuff into the project that I didn't know how to do. And part of the reason is because that's when you have the most opportunity for growth. If you're doing everything that you already know how to do, then you're not learning and you're not growing. But the key there is to being honest about it. And then you just approach it like you would most things. You say, okay, what's the next step? So even if it's a big, hairy problem that you don't know how to accomplish, you just break it down. This is a step I've got to figure out now. Okay, now that that's taken care of, let's go into the next step. It's just like the saying, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You take it one step at a time. It's, a, it's amazing how much you can learn when somebody is paying you to do it eight hours a day, <laughs> right? Yeah. So on the job learning and being intentional about creating those opportunities is the best way to do it. Yep. There's, for sure. I have this like specific take on the idea of um, like people say like force yourself to be uncomfortable get comfortable being uncomfortable. So I have this one caveat that I think is really important is that you should force yourself to be uncomfortable for things that you think provide value to you long-term. Like you don't mm -hmm. just go out and make yourself uncomfortable <laughs> cool. to waste time. Yeah, yeah. Like you, you make yourself uncomfortable because it's, you think it's the right thing to do that's going to help you learn the next thing that you need in your career. An example of this for me is I'm always, or I've been at many times in my career terrified to go into a manager's office and say, I'm, I'm, I think I'm ready for a promotion or I'm upset about this thing, or I didn't really appreciate the way you handled this or like whatever the situation is. I've literally been like shaking, like I think blah, 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 like in the office, but I forced myself to do that because I knew it was important for me to, to one practice being able to have tough conversations, but also that thing in particular was important for me in my career. And it's, I felt like it was something I need to voice. So the idea of making yourself uncomfortable should be a, like in, down a productive path of you do have to force yeah. yourself to do things because you know it's it's or you think it's going to be the thing that's going to help you build a skill or experience or like whatever it is so i love that you were able to like tackle that um take that head first or tackle it head on and then one additional thing that i think is really interesting is um i see i started this and then i forgot it right as i was talking i knew i was forgetting it and <laughs> i stumbled rats well, I can say one Go other ahead, thing yeah. just to build off of what yeah. you're saying, to, to say it a little bit differently. I have found more success in life building on my strengths as opposed to shoring up my weaknesses, mm. right? So you talk about, I feel like I have to know everything and I'm weak in X, Y, Z. Well, sometimes that's because I don't like X, Y, Z. Like I don't like backend development or I don't like SQL. Uh, I'm a front end developer, blah, blah, blah. Well, I, I feel like I need to though, because that's where I'm, I'm weak kind of throw away that mentality, right? And instead focus on what I'm good at, what I enjoy, let's say, for example, front end. And then it's easier to be uncomfortable learning maybe a new framework because that, that's something that you enjoy and something you're good at and you're building on it mm -hmm. in, in a positive direction. 100%. I realized, and I think this is related, then I'll let you go, Amy. The thing that I had forgotten was the idea. I did it again. Whole, like it comes back to me <laughs> oh, every wow. time I go to talk. You old man. I've yeah, got, I feel like I've right. done this before. I know. You old man. Actually, that's why I usually write stuff down. If I have a thought. Of wow. <laughs> if you see me like down, I'm usually writing something down. Uh, so while well, you're trying to remember again, <sighs> um, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about lately is that everybody lives with discomfort to some extent. You all have discomfort. And so you have to pick what are the things that you want to be uncomfortable about. So for example, I want to get back into running. I just feel like as I'm getting older, I'm getting sluggish. Well, I have that discomfort of being sluggish and I can either live with that discomfort of being unsluggish, or I can live with the discomfort of I'm going to train for a half and I'm going to put in the work and make my muscles sore. Both are very uncomfortable, but you have to pick which is the uncomfortableness that I want to live with. So the same thing here, do I want to live with being uncomfortable with the fact that I feel like in my job, I deserve more, that I should have that raise. Do I want to live with that uncomfort or would I rather live with the uncomfort of I'm going to go in my boss's office and yeah. have that conversation? It. So it's you, you get to pick. And <laughs> to Eric, this isn't really a positive way of looking at it. It is negative. You're talking about something that is literally uncomfortable, but I think it makes a difference when you look at it through the lens of there's always going to be uncomfort 
adaptableness and what do you want to use to grow and push you forward? Well, on the the vein of software design patterns for human relationships, <laughs> right? I think that that pattern applies to the software we choose, right? Every problem has a solution. That's true. But I think every solution has a problem, right? You talk about the scalability of some, some system. No language yeah. is perfect. No platform is perfect. Yes. And it's just about what problem do you want to have or what's more manageable? Mm -hmm. And you, you choose that. That's great. I've never never heard that phrase specifically but it it does it makes me think of like any any time someone is like you should use like if if, <laughs> if people ask what's the best framework right and they say oh it's mm -hmm. react it's like that's i that i you've lost trust with me now because you're not acknowledging the fact that like there are trade-offs with every single thing that yeah, we choose yeah. i'm going to take one more stab at this i wrote it down <laughs> okay let's go it. let's go the yeah. comment was around um saying i don't know and you kind of you said the like basically the longer in your career to try to make this transition to learning new things is being comfortable saying, I don't know, being transparent about saying, I don't know, which I think is super, super important, specifically in interviews. Like the worst thing I, you can do if you're interviewing with me is tell me, you know, something and explain it incorrectly as opposed to just saying, you don't know, mm -hmm. but also from your perspective of like taking on new things. But I think that does come with a level of, not necessarily seniority that doesn't feel like quite the right word, but I do think it comes with a certain level of experience to feel more comfortable saying, I don't know, because now you it's normalized. Like you, you know, as developers, we Google constantly, right? Yeah, Entry level yeah. developers are very con self-conscious of that because they think they should just know it. But the reality is like, that's not the case. So it does come with a certain level of experience, I think, to help ease into that comfortness of being able to say, I don't know. I would say that experience, and for me, it was the realization that everybody wants me to succeed, right? The company didn't hire me hoping I would fail. Mm -hmm. uh, my manager didn't put me on this project hoping I would fail. The The team, oh. my team lead didn't give me this task hoping I would fail. Everybody Hopefully. wants <laughs> me to succeed, yeah. right? And that means they are expecting questions, they're expecting pushback. Because that's that's part of the problem solving process. Absolutely. Are there again like setting this setting this destination? You phrased it that way earlier as the happiest, uh, world's happiest software engineer. Or what are are there any other like big things that come to mind? On are there situations that you handle differently? Are there situations that you look for that you didn't look for before? Like what are some other thoughts that you have on having that destination? of just happiness in your career as a software engineer? Yeah, good question. So I want to phrase this in, in the context of system design, right? Hmm, perfect. So when we, when we want to create a scalable system, what are the questions that we ask ourselves, right? We're talking about uh, CPU usage. We want to optimize for memory. Uh, we want to make sure we have good monitoring and alerting mm -hmm. in place. We need some project management around this to give some governance. So when I talk, when I think about happiness for, for myself, I'm working on this extended metaphor of merging all of these principles that we learn in our development world in our, in that profession into the personal development, uh, mental health world. Uh, so in a, in a long way to, to, to answer the, this question, uh, James, you know, what, what's different, right? Um, managing my own memory. Uh, so <laughs> instead of feeling overloaded and yeah. having to remember mm -hmm. everything, uh, I read the book Bullet Journaling, mm -hmm. uh, Getting Things Done, yeah. uh, two fantastic ways in which you can get things out of your head, re reduce the, the memory pressure right, of yourself. Or CPU. Oh, there you go. Great book. Nice. I was trying to think. I have GTD somewhere. Yes. Both wonderful <laughs> resources that I use every day. Or at CPU, in the context of software development, we, if you hit a certain threshold, right, you scale up. You add more nodes to your cluster, right? Um, for me, that's asking for help and being cognizant of my own alerts. For me, those are my emotions. If I'm feeling stressed or angry or overwhelmed, that is a you know a P1, P2 alert firing off. That means I need to go scale up, 
aka talk to another <laughs> member of my team to so get good. extra resources, mm -hmm. right, to, to come in and help me out. Yeah, there are so many nuances there that I feel like for the longest time, lessons I've learned in the software development world that I was failing to apply to myself. Yeah. But once I started realizing, yes, I am so much more kinder to my computers and the, <laughs> the servers that I run than I am to myself sometimes. Mm -hmm. How can I borrow some of those patterns? That's so good. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like, I feel like this would be a really cool brand for you to continue to like elaborate and create content around if it's something you're interested in. Like, that oh, yeah, yeah. Ha this has so, so much value. One of the things that seems uh, to directly correlate with me, I don't know what's wrong with my brain, but it happened again. I like slow down these sentences and I can't remember yeah. what I was going to say. I'm dying. <laughs> yeah. We got a pregnancy brain, James. Yeah. Yeah. Is it my pregnancy brain? Um, <laughs> oh, the alerting, the alerting system. I'm back. I don't know what's going on. The pregnancy brain is a thing, but that's for you, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is a thing for me. Okay. My, my wife says it's an excuse. Now. Okay. Sympathy. The, the idea of having good alerting. So let me say this before I forget and freak <laughs> everyone out again or freak myself out. So you mentioned like all the, all the good things you want with software. You mentioned scalability and all the things, and you mentioned alertability or alerting or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's one of the things I've talked a little bit about in my my talks is this idea of you have to be real with yourself. Like you have to you have to take intentional time to gauge where am I with this company, where am I with enjoyment of this job, with this culture, with my teammates, with my manager, with all the things that are going on. And you have to you have to give yourself the ability to to reflect on that in a way of like, is there something I need to change? Because it's really easy. And I, I see it all the time where like people, people at my job at FedEx that I was surrounded by, they were, they were FedEx for life and that was what they had. And there's not anything necessarily wrong with that other than their just acceptance of this is how life is and this is how software is and this is how much money I will or will not make without realizing there's a whole world out there of maybe better opportunities, maybe not, but not even like giving themselves that ability to go and look and find, find out. So this idea of alerting to myself of, hey, red flag going on, hey, error in the code type thing to go back to like mm -hmm. the code analogy is is worth like really diving into. I may steal that. I almost definitely will steal that and talk about oh, that sure. like more as a way to relate back to developers. But you have to have you have to have check ins with your with yourself to see where you where you are. So some other patterns there that I think you highlighted, right? Project management. We have the agile structure that most teams mm -hmm. operate in, which includes a retrospective mm -hmm. at the end of every iteration, right? Reserve time to reflect back on what's going well, what didn't go well. Uh, we have a backlog refinement, right? So instead of getting overwhelmed with all the things to do, there's a prioritization activity that, that goes on. Uh, sprint mm -hmm. planning, there's a commitment Absolutely. right? that yeah. you make. So you can't do everything. You, you have a long to-do list, but you commit to just a subset of that. And those are the same patterns that we can use personally. One, one other comment, uh, talking about alerting, the big takeaway for me was realizing that I am grateful for my production alerts. I would hate it when I get a <laughs> P1 or a P2 alert, right? Yeah. Oh, but I am grateful for the alert. Because it tells me I need to fix something. So similarly, yeah. I've learned that emotions are not moral. Like they mm -hmm. are not good and they are not bad. Because I'm angry, angry is not a bad emotion. <laughs> I'm grateful for that emotion because it's telling me something. Yeah. I need you know, compassion. I need to reach out and connect with a friend. I'm not feeling heard. What is that alert telling me? And then what is my standard operating procedure? That's what we use in software development <laughs> for how we respond. There you go. I need to have action plans for when I'm feeling stressed, when I'm feeling angry, when my when certain thresholds are met and be grateful for those emotions so that I can get them met. I was trying to figure out how to make a joke of like, I'm going to start saying something and pretend like I forgot, but I won't, I won't make yeah. it. <laughs> I won't, I don't need to make the joke because it's happened legitimately three times already. So. Yeah, already that's just <laughs> this is telling you something, right? Mm -hmm. I know I'm trying to think like what's the correlation with software, right? Like the logic didn't 
makes sense or infinite loop or something like i don't know yeah you have some errors in the code we're not we don't have any good logs That's here right. we I don't know. know what's going on so like maybe you write some things down have some more log statements i see right. this like this all right amy i'll go in a second. <laughs> this would be a great tiktok series too like just yeah, would, of yeah. like relating everyday life to software it'd be like i'm, I'm loving this amy go ahead yeah, do you have certain things that you do analog versus digital to help with your that are that are part of your SOPs. Uh, yes. So, um, sorry. So SOPs. So take a step back. Bullet journaling. Mm -hmm. I use a physical journal, pen and paper, uh, and then I can check it off. And there's like a feeling of completion when mm -hmm. I'm done. Uh, as far as for my SOPs, uh, some of them include calling a friend, a mm -hmm. phone a friend, because sometimes when I'm really stressed, stressed or anxious, I just need a vent a little bit to a trusted partner. Sometimes it's my spouse, depending on uh, the context. Um, or if it's about your spouse, you need somebody it's about else. about my spouse, that right? A lot. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, sometimes it involves, you know, waking, uh, getting out of my chair and just going for a walk, just yeah. stretching a little bit next to my chair and getting away from the computer. Yeah, it, it depends on the specific trigger, the specific emotion. And I'm, I haven't perfected it yet. You know, this is a, this is a process. Uh, but the goal is, to understand that I, at least for me, I am my own worst enemy. And when I was in that worst or the uh, world's unhappiest software engineering uh, mindset, world, world's unhappiest, not worst, world's unhappiest software engineer mindset, um, I was not confident that even if I changed jobs, that things would be better mm. because I would still have to be with me, right? <laughs> and <laughs> yes. and I, did, I didn't trust myself to not wow. put myself in more of the same situation, the same situations. Yeah, yes. Fair enough. So to speak specifically about that, right. I'm talking about being a people pleaser was one of yeah. the things I'm having to learn to address. I had a savior mentality. I wanted to fix everybody's problems. So I keep putting myself into these difficult scenarios. Um, I, I have like an avoidance mentality. So I would avoid conflict instead of addressing it. And all of these would bubble up so that no matter where I went, I was guaranteed to always be unhappy unless I fixed myself. I feel like I'm just going to steal everything that you say in my talk because I feel <laughs> like you're adding so. on like very valuable insights. Yeah. Because that's that's a very a very useful way to look at those situations. Cause a lot of what I talk about basically like the short of it is if you're not happy, like go and target happiness. And like part of that could yeah. be, if you don't feel like you make enough money, go and find a new company to like make mm -hmm. more money. Or if you don't feel appreciated at your company, go and find another company that's going to appreciate you has a better culture or benefit, like whatever it is, go and go and target that thing. I think you're opening up a complete side of this that I've missed is like also where you go and the happiness that you find or don't find in that next step, whatever it is, is not just dependent upon the existing stuff that's there, the, the company culture and benefits, et cetera. That's definitely a hundred percent a factor, but how you respond to where you are and the situations that you potentially have to be in, there's a big, there's a big ownership piece of that, like ownership piece, but also just a learning about yourself, like the self, the, I guess that's repetitive, the self-awareness, and the figuring out why did you end up in some of the situations that you did in the past? And if you can recognize like I'm a people pleaser and I avoid conflict, this is exactly one of those situations that I talked about in my career where I'm literally like shaking in my manager's office, trying to talk about this thing that I, I know is important to talk about, but it's deadly difficult for me to do. So if you recognize those things and then, and then use them as a learning and a teaching and a, experience opportunity for yourself going forward to help prevent yourself from falling into some of those same traps. I think that is uh, like a section of the pursuit of happiness that I haven't addressed in some of the talks that I've given. So I love that like augmentation to the stuff that I've talked about already. Well, there's certain parts of the, that ticket or that story. Oh, We're going to continue yes. the Do analogy. It. Do it. <laughs> the, it's like, how do I solve that? Like, you know, Eric, you're talking about, okay, I recognize I'm unhappy. How do I become happy? Is it just a switch? Like, oh, I'm happy now. <laughs> like, what did you do to change? Or if you realize, okay, I'm the problem here. I'm a people pleaser. Yeah. So I'm just going to stop caring about people. Like you can't just 
yeah. do that. So there's certain things as you're talking about different alert mechanisms that you need in order to have that growth mindset behavior. So tactically, I had a spike, right, where I had to <laughs> investigate so good. my, <laughs> right, the, 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 the metaphor just continues uh -huh. on, right? Uh, so for me, it was identifying, and the way I phrase it was what gives me energy. I had, and perhaps this is my own upbringing, James, I know you're just a youngin, so maybe this was different for <laughs> your, your generation. A young Young but a, as a young man, I never learned how to understand my own emotions, right? You're supposed to be stoic. You're not supposed to feel pain, right? So part of my spike was not, not trying to measure my emotions, but for me, it was measuring energy. When I say energy, it was mm. what, what do I get excited about versus what drains me? Mm. I consider myself an introvert. So I would love to be on a team, as I'm identifying new roles, uh, a team where it's consistent. I don't want to be meeting lots of different people. I, I want to have a stable team. Uh, and I, there's five or six other uh, priorities there. I want to be in a creative role. If I can design my own solutions, then I know I, I get more excited to come to work than when I'm just being dictated you know, by some ivory tower yeah. architect, right? Uh, so that once I had that list, it became easy to identify, can I make this happen in my current role? Well, well if not, what roles at what companies would, would give me that? Yeah, that's I have been a huge fan of Sarah Drasner's book, Engineering Management for the Rest of Us. And I think it's a fantastic book, even if you <laughs> don't like management, like what you're talking <laughs> about. But there's a section at the beginning that where she starts talking about values. And I don't know how you guys feel about this, but sometimes I read that I'm like, yeah, values, blah, blah, blah. Like, let's get, <laughs> give me the good stuff. And yeah. just want to breeze over that. But she suggests in there doing a value exercise with your team. So I took that to my team and I said, okay, we're going to talk about our values. And it was so eye opening because she explains in the book that a lot of times people are unhappy because their values don't align with their team and they don't necessarily mm -hmm. align with the company. And so that piece, it's like, yes, you can look at yourself and say, I'm going to take my values wherever I go. Like I'm, this is my thing. But if you can find other people that align with that, it does make it a whole lot easier. And if you can figure out what those are, and that, that's a lot of what you were just describing, like these are the things that I value and I prioritize. And so these are also the things that I'm going to be looking for when I'm trying to find a job. So what's the design pattern there, right? Mm, so as you were talking, yes. I, I felt two things, right? I feel like as a developer, I get really excited about greenfield development. I just want to start all over mm -hmm. and build a new service with the latest and greatest technologies. Well, there's no guarantee it will be any better. Mm -hmm. That legacy system probably has all of the edge cases and bugs kind of figured out. Um, so don't get too distracted by or too caught up in the idea of, I just need to get a new job and start all mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'll even say we have projects that we started at Zeal. They were Greenfield projects and we're now uh, three, four years in. That's not a Greenfield project. And all the yeah, tech debt yeah. that we have is tech debt that we created that we're responsible for. And so Yeah, that like, you brought you yeah. brought to that project. It is your yeah. fault because exactly. you didn't address exactly. something. You didn't have some core learning or whatever right. you needed. Well, and it, but I would even argue like tech debt is not even like necessarily your fault. Not that I'm trying to like displace sure. blame and not have ownership, but sometimes like, well, it's not sometimes all the time technology changes or different practices come into place or we get new versions of things. And so that yeah. all creates tech debt that you have to figure out at what point do I want to manage that? And that goes back to what we were talking about earlier. What piece of uncomfortable do we want to live with? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think, I think that's really interesting when you start talking about design patterns and bringing design into this metaphor. Yeah, and oftentimes the bottleneck in a system, oh, it's really slow. Let's start all over. Really, the bottleneck, it, maybe it's not your service. 
right? You talk about team culture. It can be, you have like a, a firewall, you have some, you know, security layer. Uh, maybe it's your load balancer. Um, maybe it's a poorly designed front end, right? Uh, rewriting the service sometimes isn't the answer. You need to look holistically of the, the whole structure you're right. in. And uh, I think having that team conversation is a great first start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I can even give you a little bit more practical example with that. So one of the things I realized I value, I did freelance for full, uh, for seven years full time was that I valued autonomy and independence. I love being able to go into a project and be able to think creatively about it, be independent and see mm -hmm. that project through. Well, I have a team member that said, I value collaboration. So Ooh, I yeah. want you, like, I want your help. And so I look at that when he's value and collaboration. I'm like, but you're not being independent. Like do it yourself. What do you need me for? Like there's friction there. And so when we were able to have that conversation about values and say, oh, like not trying not to be a team player, I'm trying to like enable you to do your job. And he's looking at me like, that's not helping me. <laughs> so yeah, uh, it, was a, it was uh, a great conversation. Neither, yeah. neither of those values are bad. It's just when you come to the table bringing both of those sets align. of things. Yeah. There's a misalignment and you've got to talk through it. Yeah. 400 error, bad request, <laughs> uh, <laughs> non-processable entity. Yeah. I don't know what you're trying to tell me to do. Absolutely. You better, uh, you better start writing this ebook. If not... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So good. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you, you highlighted an interesting topic, roles and responsibilities on, uh, of our software, right? So we have a load balancer has a specific role. We don't we don't put services on the same server that we have the load balancer on. Or we're talking about the firewall. Uh, I think similarly, sometimes it's, it's easy for developers to try and do everything. Uh, there's a pros and cons that that shift left movement. The idea of having the developer do more of what is typically done later in the SDLC uh, lifecycle typically overburdens the developer and what they have to know and what they have to do. Uh, but I think having more, and this is something I've worked on with my team, having a more clear definition of roles and responsibilities um, to prevent some of that overwhelm. So like our product owner, as, as a, the tech lead for my team, I sometimes have all these ideas and I want to write them all down and I'm creating all these tickets and I'm creating a lot of noise. So instead being intentional about engaging my product owner so that and having them write the tickets and dictate the work or sometimes developers, I just want to collaborate quickly with another developer on another team, but that just introduces so many different uh, communication touch points between teams that, uh, it can be overwhelming, but then trying to, any request I make, I direct through their product owner. So it goes to the right resource. I'm treating my product owner as a load balancer, mm. uh, essentially to, uh, there's that interesting graphic of as more, as you get a, a larger team, the, the communication lines just increase exponentially as everybody's talking to everybody, like intentionally trying to reduce that is another example mm -hmm. of a design pattern. Mm-hmm. So good. I've got um, in the last couple of minutes before we move into picks and plugs, do you want to really quickly give maybe an update on where you are now? Because I think it's easy. Like when I give a talk on similar topic to what we're talking about, people hear you talk about like, I'm the happiest developer in the world, or that's my yeah. end goal type thing. Like that also doesn't mean that we have everything figured out. I think we have things that like we've changed that we work on that we're trying to get better and better, but it doesn't mean we have it all worked out. So like how, how do you feel about like where you are with this journey versus where you were two years ago? Yes. So I am definitely much better uh, than where I was, uh, but I'm still not hundred percent where I want no. to be. And it's a, it's a journey. So for me, tactically, I have a sprint retrospective for myself that happens mm -hmm. weekly, sometimes uh, every two weeks. Uh, and I have a list of 20 or 30 different self-defeating behaviors and beliefs that I have. And I grade myself as pretty subjective on a scale of one to five. And I track how I'm doing. And then for that next iteration, I focus more on 
you know, pushing back and standing up for myself or setting boundaries or not answering emails after work. And, and it's a, it's a process and that's, that's where I'm at, but thousand times better than where I was a few years ago. Oh, love it. Yeah. It's, uh, we're all on journeys. We're all at different stages of different journeys. It's never, it's rarely ever something that we like actually have figured out to the point where we have nothing to work on anymore. But mm -hmm. I was talking about the journeys and us sharing advices and, and things we've learned along the way, I think is the valuable part. Um, cool. This has been super exciting for me or like entertaining, I guess, in a very good way. The idea, yeah. like just making all these parallels, but uh, we can wrap up and move into our picks and plug section where we pick something that we enjoy, something we watched, um, read, bought on Amazon is often what we do. Um, something that we've enjoyed recently and then plug um, anything that we want to. Um, Amy, I think, is short on time. Amy, do you want to go first with Picks and Plugs? Yeah, let's do it. I'm so excited about this one, too. So my pick is a keyboard cover called the Ghost Cover. So I previously had a butterfly keyboard that was, I loved it, but it got sticky. And this one, I have an M1, but um, I have dogs that shed. So it's just mm. gross because I felt like I was constantly getting dog hair and dust and crumbs. This makes me sound like a slob. But the yeah. ghost cover um, is just like a little uh, it? neoprene cover over my laptop keyboard. It actually has a really great texture to it, but it protects your keyboard from all that stuff getting into it. So it is fantastic. Like I said, it's called the ghost cover. So it's super thin. You can get all kinds of ones that have different colors and things things like that. But I like the fact that this one is very, very thin. So I will include a link to that. And then I'm going to plug, um, I'm going to go out on a limb here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to plug my um, Twitter account. And the reason I'm going out on a limb is because who knows what's going to happen with Twitter. But I've started posting more on Twitter. Um, I've been right. This is kind of a double plug. I've been I wrote a couple of uh, blog posts this week on Hashnode and have been tweeting about them. So I'd love to connect with people on Twitter and um, just really have had fun with some of the conversations this week. So my handle is at self teach me. Cool. Love it. Um, I can go next. Um, I got to hands on try with the creator of this extension uh, yesterday on stream uh, extension called front matter. It's a VS code extension. And it helps you manage not only just like your front matter for your markdown blog posts or any other type of markdown content, but also just like manage your entire content as if it's a headless CMS. I mean, you basically get a GUI to manage all the things, to work it, to look at your images, to search through your posts, to view your posts, to filter your posts, to add tags, to have data types defined for your front matter to scaffold creating new pieces of content. It's like mind blowingly amazing. I can't like, I've, I actually just plugged this on a previous guest or podcast I did as a guest like an hour ago. Really, really amazing. So if you work with anything embedded in Markdown in your site, check out uh, Front Matter. The link is uh, frontmatter.codes. Highly, high, highly recommend people uh, check that out. Now, is the and guy's then, name Elio? Elio? Elio, yep. Mm -hmm. He tweeted because I had written two different blog posts this week, one for VS Code extensions and another one highlighting how we're using Plop with the mm -hmm. podcast, yep. which that plugin applies to both. So uh, that mm -hmm. was one of those great conversations that came out of that. Yep. And I was getting ready to start working with Plop to scaffold out creating new content until he showed me that it could do those things. For oh, me. That's awesome. Yeah. Very exciting. So I really enjoyed that. Um, I, I'm going to plug TikTok. So James Hewquick on TikTok. And Amy probably doesn't know this, but I just released a recap video from that conference uh, with interviews where I asked people their favorite programming language. Oh, I'm on that. <laughs> fun fact, Amy was the first answer. And Amy answered CSS. And you've got all the ridiculous Whoa. comments in the yeah. video that you would expect to have. So if you're interested and want to talk shit back oh, to I people that wait. are talking shit to you, please go and do that on TikTok. <laughs> Uh, but James, you click on TikTok. So, uh, Eric, do you have picks and plugs uh, you want to share? Yes, I would say my pick, and since this is my first time on the show, this is actually a pick from probably a year ago that's been instrumental for me, and that is just getting a Kindle Oasis. Uh, so it has a night reader mode, low blue light. Uh, part of my 
mental health journey is sleeping better and having a, a good book uh, with low yes. blue light at the end of the day is a nice way to uh, fade into oblivion uh, before <laughs> I wake up. Uh, currently reading a book called Washington, A Life. Uh, it is from the same author who wrote uh, Hamilton that inspired the musical. Nice. Um, anyway, the, the Kindle and, the, and that habit of nighttime reading has been really helpful for me. Uh, and then plug, I want to plug my current employer, Yum Brands. I know there's been a lot of disruption, a lot of layoffs and hiring freezes with some big tech. Yum Brands is hiring. And I think a big part of my current enjoyment is because of the benefits and support that I've received from Yum Brands. So I, I can't speak highly enough to, to them as an employer. So reach out to me or go to jobs.yum.com to look for opportunities. Awesome. That's perfect. Amy has one supporter in the chat for CSS being a language. Um, <laughs> and I one. should have known it came from Brian. Yeah, obviously it came from <laughs> Brian because you're like, you're like the same person. <laughs> I know, it's wonderful. But yeah, I got so many, so many comments on, it's my most popular TikTok in a while. And I think people just watched it and commented so that they can say CSS isn't a language, which you got to start <laughs> with something controversial. Yeah. You do, yeah. <laughs> well, there's did. also like the, the cliche, like if you want to know the right way to solve a problem, post the wrong way, and then people will tell yeah. you the right way, mm -hmm. right? Um, anyway, fun times on. Social media. I'm reading them these. <laughs> Are you reading them on TikTok now? On, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think oh, I'm gonna do like a response video where you can quote their comment and then respond oh, and be yeah. like, or you can lying. have me. Yeah, I was gonna say me reading their things. <laughs> oh, they do like the yeah. then the mean tweets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Wow, this is uh, game changing. Okay. Hopefully people knew that was a joke. <laughs> well, but is it though? Like it's like you can define it's, language no, in a million it's, it's different ways. It's a total it troll. You definitely did it as yeah. a troll, but it also meant something personal yeah. to you. And yeah. nitpicking at the definition of program language is not the point. Obviously it was going to happen. And I think we both knew it was going to. But anyway, so check it out on TikTok if people want to know what in the world we're talking about. <laughs> All right. I think that's going to wrap up the episode. Eric, thank you for joining us. This is like really entertaining, really insightful and uh, prepare to see my next talk have half of what you just said <laughs> inside of it. So look to just make sure you, you quote me quote. Right. Yes. There you go. Uh, okay. I'll, uh, I'll make sure to quote and uh, <laughs> yeah, all the things. So anyway, thank you for joining us. Thanks everyone for listening. If you're listening on the podcast, make sure to leave a rating and a review to help other people find the podcast so we can continue to have on great guests like Eric. In the meantime, that's all we got. All right, I'm going to go ahead and hit the button. Amy's got to run. Thank you all for watching. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Thank you.